Today we're going to be talking about chapter 19 of Anatomy and Physiology, the Cardiovascular System. This chapter is going to be mo fo focusing mostly on the blood. So if here you look at the, the different functions of the blood, I'm just going to go through the key highlights that you should know. So this one it says transport of gases, nutrients, and waste products. The most important thing you need to know here is that um, the red blood cells in, in the blood are the ones that carry oxygen to the cells to give them energy and then they also take back carbon dioxide which is the waste product from the cells so we can exhale that out and get rid of get it out of our bodies the second one transport of process molecules so not just oxygen and carbon dioxide and other stuff like that it also can transport different things like vitamin d and also lactic acid basically anything that needs to get around the body the blood can transport it um, Additionally, transport of regulator regulatory molecules. An example of a regulatory molecule is a hormone, which basically um, keeps your body in check and tells your body what it should be doing at any given time. Um, so those can, so hormones are traveled in the bloodstream as well. Then we have regulation of pH and osmosis. There's these things called buffers. These are um, little molecules that make sure that your bloodstream stays in its happy range of 7.35 to 7.45. Um, if your blood is too acidic or too basic, these buffers are going to do their best to bring it back to where it's supposed to be. All right, maintenance of body temperature. Um, basically, you have more um, heat in the core of your body and towards the interior than rather under your surface, like in your fingertips. So, and one of the ways that you can regulate your body temperature is through vasodilation and constriction. So, when it's really, really hot outside and you want to get rid of some heat, your, your blood vessels are going to open up and dilate so that the blood vessels get closer to the, the skin surface so it's easier for the, the, the heat to escape and evaporate in the form of sweat. Now when it's cold, your veins are going to want to constrict and hold on to that heat so that the veins shrink away from, that, from the outside of the skin so that none of the heat gets evaporated or whisked away um, through evaporation. Now protection against foreign substances. This is like germs, bacteria, viruses. Your white blood cells are going to be the ones that are going to basically be in charge of making sure that you aren't getting infected. And then clot formation. Those um, clot formations, like when you get a, get a cut, you start bleeding, you don't want to bleed out and die. So your platelets are going to be the ones that, kind of, it's kind of like a scab forming inside of your, your veins so that you don't keep bleeding. Now if we turn to this page real quick, it's going to show a lovely, beautiful diagram. So if someone were to get a blood sample drawn and put it in a test tube, and if you could somehow separate the contents of your blood, kind of like if you were to look at all the different ingredients in your blood, like uh, all the different things in a salad bowl, it'd be separated like this. So more than half, about 55% of what your blood is actually made of is called plasma. Plasma, now is further analyzed, plasma is made up of mostly water, so 91%. So, mo more than half of your blood is actually water, which is why it's so important to stay hydrated. Now, the only other thing that's important is that there's some proteins that are in this plasma. These proteins are albumin, globulin, and fibrinogen. Now, this is going to be important um, for probably a test or for later on in the chapter. The thing you should know is that what each one of these do. So, albumin, this is just a quick summary. Albumin, its job is to um, regulate the osmotic pressure. Globulins are protecting from microorganisms, and fibrinogen helps against clots, as we will learn about a little bit later. Now, back to the blood. So 55% of that was mostly water and some proteins. The other part, the formed elements, which are um, further analyzed over here, most of the formed elements are actually red blood cells. So that is why overall your blood appears red because red is, the red blood cells have that um, red pigment to them. And you have white blood cells and platelets. So these are the three formed elements or the, really the key players in your bloodstream. So if you want to know, um, there's more than one type of red blood cell. There's actually five types of red, uh, just kidding, I said, I mean white blood cells. There's five types of white blood cells and they're over here. They are neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. I'm not going to go too in-depth in this now because we're going to go into depth in that later. Um, basically, just real quick, the neutrophils 
the eosinophils and basophils are all considered as one class, hence they both all end with phil, and then the lymphocytes and the monocytes are considered a different class, because they both end with site, but we'll talk about that later. Now, um, that has been an introduction to the, the bloodstream, the cardiovascular system. Next, we will be talking um, about production of formed elements. Um, so basically, the, pr the formed elements were the red blood cells, the white blood cells, and the platelets. So this is telling you how they are made, how they're produced. So it says here, the process of blood cell production is called hematopoiesis. Now, we this is going to be important for other vocabulary later. The root word heme here is in reference to blood. So anytime you think heme, think um, th anything to do with like the formed elements. So, moving on, this um, chart here might, or diagram might be intimidating at first, but once you understand what it's saying, it's not too bad. So, as we learned, hematopoiesis is the production of all the formed elements. So what this is trying to show you, all of this, this whole process here, is hematopoiesis. So we have, as the result at the bottom, we have a red blood cell, the five different types of white blood cells, the monocytes, lymphocytes, neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. These are all the white blood cells. And then platelets as the last option. So we have three options. Platelets, white blood cells, and red blood cells. So this is, this is the process of how they're all formed. Now, in order to make one of these three formed elements, you have to start with a stem cell, which here is called a hemocytoblast. So here we have that root word again, heme, for um, a formed element. And then a key word here, blast. Um, throughout anatomy and physiology, blast always refers to the construction of or the building of. I like to think B for build. Um, in other chapters, we've learned that osteoblasts are cells that build bone. Myoblasts are cells that build muscle. So here, a hemocytoblast is um, a cell of formed element that is going to be building um, these formed elements. So, a stem cell has the ability to form any one of these end results. So it hasn't really differentiated yet or chosen which path it wants to take. So once it decides which one of these it wants to become, then it goes through all these different processes to get there. Now, I wouldn't be worried too much about all the in-betweens of what's going on, but mostly just the beginning points and the ending points. So here we have a red blood cell. Let's say your stem cell wanted to become a red blood cell because maybe you started, maybe you donated blood and now you need to make more red blood cells. So this whole process of turning into a red blood cell is going to be called erythropoiesis. See here? Erythropoiesis. Now that sounds a lot like hematopoiesis. Hematopoiesis is the production of any type of formed element. Erythropoiesis is specific to the formation of a red blood cell. And it's called erythropoiesis because a scientific name for a red blood cell is actually an erythrocyte. It's right there. Erythrocyte. E-R-Y-T-H-R-O-C-Y-T-E. So we start out here. The very first um, thing it has to turn into from a stem cell is called a proerythroblast. So pro is like pre, so like before. And erythro is the stem for red blood cell, and blast is building. So this is the cell that's going to be building an erythrocyte. So you go through all this, blah, 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 and you get a red blood cell. Now, about red blood cells is that they do not have a nucleus. They are, um, they are kind of shaped like a donut. Um, they're concave here, so they're flattened out in the middle. There's no nucleus, and they're also non-motile, which means they cannot move on their own. They are strictly dependent upon the bloodstream pushing them around to where they need to go. Like a, uh, a stick caught in a stream is just pushed along with the current. They cannot move by themselves. Now if the stem cell wants to become a certain type of white blood cell, excuse me, um, you have remember the, the two different classes we mentioned before. The ones that end with fills and the end, ones that end with sites. So Something about these is that these are called the granulocytes and these are called the agranulocytes. Now, 
when you ever you put an a in front of a word, it means the opposite of. Like for example, we have the word normal and abnormal. One means normal, and abnormal means the opposite of normal, so it's strange. So if this is granulocytes, it means it has granules inside, and you can see like the little dots and stuff that are in there, little granules. And these are agranulocytes, which means they don't have granules, and you can see that they're just they're smooth and they don't have the dots like these are. Now this is important um, because it might help you remember which ones are which. Um, these are called the basophils, eosinophils, and neutrophils because they're named off of how they respond to dye um, or a stain. If you were to look at any one of these white blood cells under a microscope, you might not be able to tell which one is which because they're generally all the same size. It might look the same, but they all have different functions and purposes that they do, so a doctor might want to know which one is which. So a way that they would find out which ones are which is they would inject a stain or a dye into the specimens and how they react would tell them which one they are. So basophils, for example, um, they will stain a color or change color when they are in the presence of basic dye, hence BAS, base, basophils. So if these little granules stain um, in a basic dye, it's a basophil. An eosinophil is the opposite. It, these little granules will stay in a certain color in the presence of acid dye. And then neutrophil, hence the word neutro, will, their granules will stain in either a basic or acidic, because it um, neutral, it would balance it out. And these guys don't have granules, and they do not stain. And the way you could tell these two apart is because lymphocytes are the, the littlest, L for little, lymphocyte little, little lymphocyte, out of all the white blood cells, and the monocytes are the biggest ones out of all the white blood cells. Now, white blood cells do have a nucleus. They, um, I like to think of it as they have a little brain because they are motile. They can move around by what we call amoeboid movement. So they kind of, you know, move around and like shake a little bit, like, kind of like an amoeba would. They can slip through um, tight spaces between cells to get where they need to go. So they kind of have a brain to tell them, you know, I need to go over here, I need to go over there, as opposed to the red blood cell, which cannot move on its own, so it doesn't need a brain. And the last one we have are the platelets. The platelets start with a megakaryoblast. And I say, I circled mega because it's really big, and you can see how it's getting bigger and bigger, and see how big this is compared to all the other ones. And it's so big that it can't, it can no longer really fit through your tiny veins, so it splits up into tiny little pieces. So that's why they're called platelets. They turn into these tiny little fragments. And so these platelets are called thrombocytes. I don't think I mentioned um, the scientific name for white blood cells. I'm sorry. So we have erythrocytes slash red blood cells. We have leukocytes slash white blood cells. And that's where we get the term leukemia from. People who have a disease with their white blood cells, leukemia. And then back to platelets, we have, these are called thrombocytes, and they do not have a nucleus. In fact, they're not even really a full cell because they're just a broken up pieces of this one. So they do not have their own nucleus.